Here's the story about a piece no one asked for. I created a piece of art that we call the Echoes of Shazam that shows all these different characters of different licensing uh, that are all sort of born of the influence of the original Captain Marvel, the character you now know as Shazam. And it's all circulating this one piece of art, which is actually this piece of art. It's a, this is a pencil drawing, an 11 by 17 sheet of paper that I've just copied and then done markers and colored pencil on top of to create a thing that kind of is like a painting, except not a painting, but uh, it may be as much as I ever do with it. But its entire life purpose was to be shared with people so they would see it online, see it eventually in print, and just sort of react to it with a whole, oh, I think I know what he's doing, or what is he doing, and ask questions. So here's my answers for that. I got something from my oldest sister, Normandy, that was a gift I was asking for previously. I had said, hey, I, I would love to get a copy of this album that she had, and I was asking her if she could just give me her old album of Frank Zappa's 200 Motels. The album of 200 Motels for me stands out in my memory as something my sister had when I was a kid. And the cover artwork, which is part of the movie poster, um, it was something I think I saw on her wall from when it was a poster and uh, the poster came inside the album. Um, it was a distinctive piece for how much detail was crammed into this one illustration. All these little miniature scenes from within the movie itself and I knew I would apply it to something in my professional work, probably. Maybe some Captain America composition where he's the big head in the background. There's a bunch of stuff all around him. And suddenly it hits on me this very old idea I'd had for a good 12 or 15 years of showing kind of a, a big gang-up piece of Captain Marvel and all these characters that he influenced over time. Sort of an alternate reality of... Here he's meeting all these counterparts. And so Frank Zappa's face here influenced the layout of the face of Shazam, the wizard, if none of you know him by that name, the big glowy wizard in the background there. That was what I first started to sketch out. This was my original drawing where I was drawing on just an 11 by 17 sheet of paper. And since I was drawing as fast as I was thinking, it was very roughly laid out, so it wasn't as tight as the pencils you see here. But I was initially laying in a bunch of these characters with the focus on the original archetypes of C.C. Beck style Captain Marvel and Billy Batson in the front. So I thought it'd be cool to just sort of build out this piece as, as if they're all standing around, but everybody's kind of positioned around the classic Captain Marvel and Billy Batson and it would draw attention to the fact they are the focus of all this other stuff that grew out from his mythology. And when you say grow out from his mythology, what that means is when he came up in 1939, came out in 1940 when he was published, um, he basically was this next stage of creative uh, concept in comics where Instead of the hero who changes from another set of clothes into another identity, it's now a complete and total changeover of body. It's two separate individuals, two different bodies entirely. So the idea of it also being a kid who becomes an adult was a wonderful thing that connected with young readers at the time in the 40s and made him one of the most popular characters in comics. Particularly the writing of Bill Parker and then eventually Otto Binder made this book one of the most celebrated in comics history. In fact, when comics sold their best, he outsold Superman and everybody else. And he is often considered to be just another version of Superman, but there's so much more to it than that. The very tropes of saying a magic word and becoming something else, or having sort of an electrical transformation where a lightning bolt comes down and boof, poof, you're suddenly another thing. That was Captain Marvel's gift to the creative landscape and then countless other well-known characters and many unknown characters copied it verbatim. There's a whole lot that I'm kind of throwing in here that involves some pretty jokey uh, inclusions too. The fact that I did like all the actors that played Captain Marvel and Billy Batson is from the 1970s is meant to sort of show 
here's how this affected both comics publishing and here's how it affected television. And then when you get back, the sort of black and white versions of Captain Marvel and Billy Batson are from the movie serial version in the 1940s where Captain Marvel was played by Tom Tyler. And even way at the back there, drawn at this size, by the way, this is the size I was drawing at, so when you look closely at the art, I'm drawing these heads that are, you know, smaller than my toenail, uh, my baby toenail. Um, there's Isis and her alter ego from her TV show in the 70s. Up front here, I threw in the big counterpoint from Marvel, which is the current using, character using the name Captain Marvel, uh, who is Carol Danvers, who now has her own movie. And I kind of illustrated it slightly more realistically in this version. And as a goofy kind of counterpoint to the record album that inspired me, and this is what I was thinking of on Christmas evening this last year, so I sort of imitated this pose here by this one figure encroaching upon the woman here and sort of imitated it with the Carol Danvers Captain Marvel with another version of, again, Captain Marvel that was done in the mid-60s where somebody took the name from its obscurity as it had fallen into the public domain where they created this ridiculous character called Captain Marvel who said the magic word Zam and which was spelled X-A-M, uh, and his body would split apart into different pieces that would suddenly go out and fight the evildoers somehow. It was terrible power set, but they made multiple comics of this thing, and it was amongst the really oddball characters designed in the 1960s. Um, this is what actually prompted Marvel Comics to create their own version of Captain Marvel, who they then established by the late 60s, which was this green and white costumed figure here, who would eventually transform over time into being this version from the 70s, which eventually begat the follow-up version of Ms. Marvel, who then herself would evolve into becoming this Captain Marvel there. But there's also, by Marvel as well, there's the Captain Marvel who was from the 1980s, after they killed off this one, because this book didn't sell so much anymore, um, they created this woman, who was the first woman to hold the name, and she had it for some time. And then eventually, when they felt that wasn't playing well anymore, they created yet another one, which is this guy over here, who's considered to be the son of this guy. And his book sold for a while. In fact, I was enlisted to do a costume redesign of him, which is this green and black starry costume figure of Captain Marvel. And then again, that ran out. They made some toys of it, by the way, though. Um, and then eventually they decided, hey, we got to keep this name. We got to always have somebody called that name Captain Marvel. We can't have it revert over to the original character so that now DC owns it. So then they gave the name to Carol Danvers. And all the while, DC has kept publishing this character that they can call Captain Marvel in the books, but they can't use that title on any cover because of uh, trademark issues. And because they were set to make their own movie, they were not going to run into lawsuit issues with Marvel Comics over any attempt at mentioning not just the name Captain Marvel, but even the word Marvel, which frankly the word Marvel wouldn't have been popularized in comics without the history of this popular character from the 40s. His name, the Marvel family of which he was the leader, is kind of the cornerstone of comics royalty. Um, one you might notice right away in this piece that's one that would demand examination is, what is Thor doing in there? And if you think about Thor, and if you know about his history of being a double identity between the Dr. Donald Blake, who has a cane, and then he strikes the cane into the ground, and both the cane transform, it's a, he transforms into Thor. It's with a bolt of lightning. No magic word, but it was basically Jack Kirby's first, or one of his many kind of influences he took from the original Captain Marvel that he very much respected. In fact, Kirby's part of impact of Captain Marvel in his life is has a lot of different levels to it. For one thing, when he and his partner Joe Simon were working on Captain America comics for uh, Marvel Comics in the 1940s, 
they took a side gig working on the very first issue of Captain Marvel Adventures um, for Fawcett Publishing. And they did this whole comic book as just a commercial gig. And when word got out about it to the publisher of Marvel, which was then called Timely, when word got out to that publisher, he decided, hey, you guys broke the contract faith we had of you just working on Captain America for us. And now he fired them off of Captain America. So it had sort of a detrimental effect on his life, but Kirby always had a respect for the character and the art style and the storytelling of it. So one of the things that's unique in this piece is there's a sketch over here that most real hardcore fans like me would appreciate. This shot drawing of what's a Kirby drawing of Captain Marvel as I rendered it as closely as possible, is in there because Captain Marvel has a huge connection to Jack Kirby. In fact, the whole reason that we have the original Captain Marvel back is because of Jack. I didn't know that until I'd already done this sketch, and then I contacted uh, Kirby's friend and biographer, Mark Evanier, to see what he would have to say about Jack's ambitions of ever doing anything with the character. Presumably, I thought he would have done it for Marvel Comics back when they wanted to christen their own made up Captain Marvel, that maybe he could have talked them into doing this again. Well, that wouldn't have been possible because Fawcett Publishing, that originally sell these comic books in the 40s, they made an agreement with DC Comics that they would no longer publish the character and would not license it to anybody else to publish. That meant that the only person who could license the character would be DC. DC never thought about it as a character that they would seek out and try and do anything with until Jack Kirby brought it up to them. And the reason Jack brought it up to them is that when he defected from Marvel to, set, to, to DC in 1970, he had a whole number of projects, including the New Gods, that he was developing. And in that time, his expectation was, when he made the deal with Carmine Infantino to come over there, was that he would also get a number of projects that he could helm as both writer and editor. He didn't necessarily want to draw everything they laid his time to. And so he thought he could edit stuff from where he moved to in California. And that was their presumed agreement. He pitched to Carmen Infantino, what about reviving Captain Marvel? And Carmine's reaction was, apparently, by the witness that was there, Mark Evanier, that Fawcett would want too much money for the license. And Jack's response was, how do you know? Why don't you just ask them? And the proposal was essentially that Jack would edit the book, possibly write it, but that he would desire to hire back the original artist creator, C.C. Beck, and just have the book be exactly what it was in the 1940s. Don't change it, don't modernize it, don't give him bell bottoms or anything that would make him sort of hip for today's crowd. Just give the character back to the fans who have missed him and for a new generation. And this took some convincing because DC genuinely was afraid of what they were going to be told when they approached Fawcett. Fawcett's reaction, as Mark told me, was essentially, oh, well, how much would you want to pay for us for that? So they didn't have a set amount. They didn't have a giant expectation of what it would be worth because they were making no money off of it anyways. It was a defunct character for them, nothing that was generating any income. So they made the deal. DC started to get really excited and ambitious about the idea of a rollout of a new Shazam comic. And the first thing to go would be an editor on the West Coast. They wanted to keep the business close to home, keep it edited out of their offices in Manhattan. And Jack suddenly had no claim on this thing that he was ultimately responsible for getting them to pursue bringing it back. Um, it's unfortunate Jack's name wouldn't be attached to this because the whole reason we have the character now back is due to Jack's mindfulness, his, his vision. Um, seems like nobody at DC had the idea of pursuing this. Ironically, um, on the other level with Marvel, whereas Jack is never accredited with any invention of their version of Captain Marvel, the character known as Marvel, that would be this guy, the one in the green and white, um, Jack would certainly lay no, lay no claim to what you see there. 
he'd had no pitch he made to them about doing a character called Captain Marvel for Marvel Comics. But as he did tell Mark Evanier, and Mark feels uncomfortable, as he told me, to claim he knows for a fact that Jack did have this conversation with Stan Lee, but that he had thrown out an idea in the past about maybe a new character they create as one of these Kree soldiers that they had developed this alien race, the Kree, and the Kree soldier could be a defector who basically goes native for the Earthlings and comes here to conquer us, turns around protecting us. And that conversation didn't go anywhere because Jack was trying to get a new contract with the publisher owner of the company, Martin Goodman, that was not forthcoming because Jack could not make his deal improve there. And then he ultimately walked away from the company in 1970. But before that happened, suddenly they published a character called Captain Marvel with the background of being a Kree soldier who went native for the Earthlings. And that was one of the many steps as well as like taking the character he clearly was credited for creating of Silver Surfer and doing it without him in his own series and other slights that Jack felt were too numerous of not being treated with enough respect. So it may be that the reason we have two active Captain Marvel characters today, whether it's the one you know as Shazam or the one who is now Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, is all because of Jack Kirby and things that he threw out there. This is the thing I drew over my Christmas break. Um, I started on Christmas evening and over the next several days I started to research more of these characters and refine the art through referencing actual pictures of the characters and whatever and I started adding a whole bunch more figures. So all this is is just a pencil drawing on an 11 by 17 sheet of paper and since I started it on Christmas evening I didn't exactly line up my composition perfectly so it's clearly not centered properly so that Shazam or Captain Marvel and Billy are not right in the center like they should be. If I had turned this into a painting, I would have corrected that. Um, my next step was like, I just wanted to see what it would look like in color. I wasn't sure if I would ever make it as a painting because I can't sell it. It's got all these licenses I don't have here. And you can't mix Marvel and DC and everybody else's stuff together. So this is markers and colored pencil on top of a copy of this. So it is only 11 by 17. Part of it was putting in the time was the fun of how tight could I get with the pens I had. I had these wonderful Japanese ink pens that I was using that could get super fine little inking detail. And since I'm not an inker, this was quite a thing for me to play with. But I was having fun with it. I don't expect it to represent the best I can do as an artist. But since most of the point of it was not to be paintings of figures. I wasn't trying to make them look all three-dimensional and realistic. That would just seem to separate from maybe some of the photographic seeming type shots of the actors, which I embellished with pencil. And I knew it would exist for no other reason than to be shared, to be put out online, to eventually be printed in a magazine, or whatever way I could show it in a sketchbook, just to sort of make this sort of broad declaration of, here's a character and a creativity that I respect so much that should be acknowledged for how big its footprint in history is. And that footprint is in some ways lost to confusion because so many existing characters owe something of a debt to this concept. 